So welcome everyone. I'm Matt Russell at the University of Minnesota. Uh, this is the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative and the University of Minnesota Extension's forestry webinar. Uh, we're really happy today to uh, be talking about a really important forest health issue, uh, both here in the Twin Cities, uh, around Minnesota, uh, and also Wisconsin as well, um, and that's oak world. Um, and we're really going to be talking today about um, really the biology and kind of an introduction to oak wilt. Um, and then we'll hear from a number of case studies um, about oak wilt. And there should be plenty of chairs. There's more chairs on the back. Um, there's some chairs on the sides too for folks uh, that are joining us here in Green Hall. Uh, and so I do want to acknowledge uh, the funders for this project. Uh, you'll hear from some speakers, uh, those case studies, and the Silviculture Library, uh, where those case studies reside are really available through a project uh, that the University of Minnesota has uh, through the Renewable Resources Extension Act, and that's a program with um, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Uh, so we're really supportive and, and uh, really appreciative of that work. Um, uh, and so with that, uh, for those of you that are joining us on WebEx, uh, you should be seeing the slides now, Introduction to Oak Wilt and its Management. Uh, we do also encourage you to submit questions in the chat area uh, in the WebEx that should be kind of in the lower right side. Uh, and we'll be sending links there as things come up uh, that our speakers mentioned um, and as other uh, topics come up that we think might be of interest to the audience. So uh, do submit questions, do submit comments, and we'll try to relay those to the speakers uh, as they come. The format for today, we have three speakers today. Two of them are with us here in St. Paul. Uh, and one of us is joining us remotely. Um, and so we'll do the two presentations from here in St. Paul. We'll have time for one or two questions probably in between speakers. Um, and so do, as you have questions, think of them, write them down in the chat area, and then we can relay those to the speakers as they come up. Uh, and other than that, we should, we plan to wrap up by about one o'clock. We may go a little over if there are additional questions that folks have. Um, and so that's kind of the format for the rest of today. And so uh, with that, uh, I want to introduce Jenny Joswick. Uh, Jenny is a research plant pathologist for the U.S. Forest Service uh, Northern Research Station. And she's going to talk to us about oak wilt and its management and really an introduction to setting the stage for many of the other case studies that we're learning about. So Jenny, take it away. Thank you, Matt. I guess I'm the uh, warm-up band for the main concert today. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. And uh, what I plan to do is distill what I talk about in an hour, hour and a half down to 15 minutes. So hopefully I'm successful. But I was asked to give you uh, an update on the distribution of oak wilt. I'll go over briefly biology of oak wilt and um, briefly management and then kind of um, move into a, a springboard for the other two speakers and their case studies. So I'll move along if I can move along here. Is it the, the uh, page? Should be left and right. The right arrow? Yeah, let me get quick. Uh, it's the not. Well, so that should work. So a space bar will get you. Okay, great. Technical difficulties here. Well, now we went off. More technical difficulties. Well, I'll continue on. So oak wilt is a major disease in the eastern United States. It's a, um, one of the primary disease problems of, of oak species. And it is found currently in 24 states of the United States and nowhere else in the world. So only known to exist in the U.S. and in the eastern U.S. Um, let's see, I can't remember all my other points for that. <laughs> Keep going here while Matt's working on it. Okay. Um, it is particularly a, a severe problem in the upper Midwest. And when I say that, I'm thinking particularly of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, and in Texas. So a lot of control efforts going on there. Um, two other colleagues of mine, one in Texas and one in Iowa, and I believe that uh, the oak wilt fungus is likely an introduced pathogen to the U.S., but as I said, we don't know where else it occurs, if it occurs elsewhere in the world. That's just our hypothesis. Um, okay, then I wanted to move into the brief history and distribution of oak wilt. So oak wilt was first discovered, well, first observed, the problem that looks what we call oak wilt today was first observed in the 1880s in Wisconsin but it was never fully described as a disease 
and the cause of that disease never uh, discovered until the early 1940s, and that was in Wisconsin. And so in uh, 1942, in fact, the, the causal fungus was first described, a species new to science. So I'm on the, this Matt's trying to get me on the right page now. Okay, we, now we're um, looking at a map on the right distribution of current distribution of oak wilt in Wisconsin. I thought it would be good to, to start off with Wisconsin because that, of course, is where it was first dis um, picked up and then later described. So the right now, 64 of the 72 counties in Wisconsin are confirmed to have oak wilt, but I do want to to mention the information I got from Kyoko Scanlon, a forest health specialist with the Wisconsin DNR, that um, you'll see, hopefully you'll see some snow print anyway at the bottom of the screen, just indicating how recently new counties have been added to the Silk Wilt Range. And basically in the last 10 years, 10 new counties have been found to have Oak Wilt in uh, Wisconsin. And you can see those in the, the yellow and the brown. Um, and then um, you'll see that nine of those are actually in northern Wisconsin, one in eastern Wisconsin, and two of those new, quote, new counties have been found in, were found in 2018. So very interesting that there seems to be a northward uh, expansion of the Oak Wilt range. In Minnesota, I've chosen uh, to give you two different views, and I went to Brian Schwingle, forest health specialist with the Minnesota DNR, to get the latest maps. The map you see on the right. On the left is the uh, forest health section of the Minnesota DNR's map for confirmed oak wilt sites between 1987 and 1999. I just want to give you kind of a, you know, a back then and now uh, view of this. So all the, the blue dots there, you can see them mostly clustered around uh, the metro area, the Twin Cities metro area. Um, but Oak Wilt was known to exist down in southeastern Minnesota back to 1946-47 uh, when the French first picked it up. Um, and then fast forward to 2012 to 2019, the map on the right, you can see there are these purple dots there we go. I have a cursor moving. So we go all the way up to Pine County as the northernmost uh, current uh, oak wilt situation that we know of northward in Minnesota and then westward to Morrison County, uh, the northwestern extension right now that we know of according to Brian Schwingle. And these are fairly recent since 2012. And then kind of uh, the gray area indicates what was reported in the map on the left. Whoops, we need to go back. And then southeastern Minnesota, you see the purple triangles down there as well. But that's more just kind of intensification, filling in of what has occurred over the decades since first discovery in the late 1940s. So that's the situation for locations as documented by the Minnesota DNR. Um, and I think this is a very interesting slide which shows in the shaded area for the map of Minnesota, the gray and the pink together, you probably can't see it, it looks like pepper or sprinkled all over there, but that is actually the model range of oak, red oak forests in Minnesota. And the, the shaded, the pink shaded is kind of a modeled area of oak wilt, documented oak wilt by the Minnesota DNR with a 25 mile buffer. And then the gray shaded to uh, above that is actually still within the range of northern uh, red oak forest in Minnesota. And the point being that there is room for expansion of the oak oak forest in Minnesota. And as Brian Schwingle states, there still is a lot of red oak forest to protect from oak wood within this state. So moving on then to some more of the basic biology, the causal organism I talked about as being a fungus, it is a fungus that we used to know as uh, Ceratocystis fagaceum, but has recently been re-described, uh, got its own genus, Brettsiella, um, retained the same species name. So Brettsiella fagaceum is the current name for the fungus. It's easily culturable in the laboratory, which is great in terms of getting a lab diagnosis. It's not, uh, it's not that difficult. 
um, on the top photos you see on the left top the, what the fungus looks like growing in culture on a petri dish on auger media to the right are the asexual spores called conidia and then below if you do some extra um, finagling in the lab you can actually produce the sexual spores called ascospores they're formed in fruiting bodies called parathecia so the good news is we can culture the fungus pretty easily in nature the fungus occurs in the form of uh, oak wilt fungus mats that occur in on the inner face of a the bark of a tree that has been recently killed and on the outer face of the sapwood and the, it's kind of a felt like mat where the vegetative growth of the fungus occurs and we get sporulation there as well with the, the sexual and asexual spores and then there are these sterile uh, structures called pressure pads and they form on the inner bark and the outer um, xylem and as they come together and grow they cause the bark to split and they get a vertical crack and that's uh, the method by which insects are able to come into those mats and I'll talk about this a bit later and I should mention um, that the oak wilt fungus has a very, to me, a very sweet smell. Some people would think it's not very sweet, but uh, it smells like a ripe fruit salad or juicy fruit gum smell uh, in culture as well as in the woods. These mats are formed in the peak production in Minnesota in the spring and the fall. Okay, uh, over 34 species of Quercus oaks are susceptible to the oak wilt fungus, i.e. I'm talking about infection by the oak wilt fungus, but whether the disease actually progresses rapidly and has severe impact on the tree depends on whether it's in the red oak group or in the white oak group. So the red oak group species are very susceptible to that uh, rapid regression of the disease in an infected tree and to mortality. Uh, for instance, um, we have Quercus gruber here in the state and um, ellipsoidalis are common species and those trees will die very quickly within um, even within a growing season being um, infected they can die within six to eight weeks that fast or become infected and die the next year um, and this is and i'm not showing you symptoms of the, what the disease looks like on, on a leaf level but there are some differences between what it looks like in a um, red oak species versus a white oak, but I just don't have time here. So in the white oak species, um, the tendency to, to spread within the tree and then kill a tree, um, it, it's, um, it occurs over a much longer period of time than in the red oak species. So for Quercus macrocarpa burrow, we see a progression from initial infection to tree mortality can take two, three to five years. And in Quercus alba, right, it, can, it can take decades for a tree to die. And the patterns of the wilt development in, let's say, burr and white versus red are very different. But then, again, that's for another lecture. All right, once the fungus enters a tree, uh, generally it spreads internally throughout the tree, causing the systemic type of movement that you see there. So if you get an infection up in the tree crown, uh, through the diurnal sap flow of the tree, the pathogen spores, um, and they're primarily the in, it's the endocanidia, can move uh, downward at night as you know the sap flow goes downward, and then during the day during transpiration it can go back up. Or if the infection comes in the roots, it can then uh, be pulled upward, uh, especially during the daytime with the upward pull of the transpirational um, movement of the sap. Okay, the fungus is transmitted in, um, two, in two general ways. I'll talk about above ground transmission of the fungus and below ground. So we'll start with the above ground. Um, and I don't know how many people are familiar with oak bark beetles, but they are considered a major uh, vector of the oak wilt fungus in, in other parts of the United States, Eastern U.S., but um, in, through research we've done here, we consider the oak bark beetles to be uh, relatively minor uh, vectors. So I'll, I'll be talking more about the sap beetles or the nitidulid beetles, and we think those are the primary vectors of the oak wilt fungus 
in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and I believe we'll find out from Michigan pretty soon. They're doing current work on that now. So what happens is these sap beetles or nidadulid beetles um, are strongly attracted to uh, the, the odors of volatiles produced by the fungus in these oak rope mats that you see on the bottom left. Uh, they come in, visit those, they'll actually lay their eggs in there, rear the broods in those mats. They'll emerge with, by having casually acquired the spores of the fungus on their bodies, either the conidial state or the ascospores. And then they are also strongly some species. In, in fact, I, I'll just limit it to Carpophilus and Coopter species from Minnesota. Um, those species are strongly attracted to the fresh wound volatiles. If you wound a healthy oak it, down to the, the, the sapwood or into the wood, those volatiles are strongly attracted to uh, Coopters and Carpophilus species of the Nidadulidae family. And it, they can come in, I've seen them come in, I hate to say this, I've wounded quite a few trees to study this, but they'll be there within 10 minutes of making a fresh wound if you're near an oak grove site. So they're very strongly attracted, and then they casually, um, the spores are casually kind of rubbed off, and then they um, infect the, the exposed xylem elements. So, in order for this transmission of the fungus to occur by an epidural beetle, there are uh, a number of requirements needed for successful transmission, but the two key ones are we need these oak wilt mats formed and available. And as I already mentioned, spring and fall are the times that we see peak mat production in, in Minnesota, um, but our spring is really our high risk period. And I don't think I'll get into that too much now, but, uh, but we need those mats being um, available for the insects to come into, and then fresh wounds, as I've already mentioned, and timing of those fresh wounds is also very key um, as to how successful uh, the insect will be in transmitting the organism. The key approaches to managing insect spread um, by nidadulid beetles um, are as follows. We have, uh, you've probably heard this for a number of other insect, key insect, uh, pests of trees as well as other diseases. We don't want to move uh, firewood. And you can see the truck here with a, a load of firewood. We don't want to move firewood or oak logs in commercial trade, say to the mill, from oak wilt diseased areas into healthy areas because the mats may form on those logs and then the insects could be on there and they could emerge in the new location and go to wounded trees. So that's, um, that rule applies, of course, to other situations like EA green and other key problems that we have. Secondly, we um, advise people to remove potential oak wilt mat producing trees and um, to remove them before the mats form and then to properly dispose of them. And I won't go into all those techniques, but uh, that's very key. It's also called sanitation. And thirdly, um, prevent wounding of oaks particularly during the high risk months. And for Minnesota, that's somewhere between the end of March, early April to about mid-July. A number of factors involved in making that decision, but um, a little bit just in that general range of time. Okay, the other uh, transmission that really is most pertinent to what we'll hear about today is below ground spread. And that occurs via connected root systems. And you'll see in the disease cycle on the left, the little highlighted circle, and then I have a photo that I had taken where we had actually excavated. Important to emphasize that the fungus spores, and we think it's primarily those asexual spores that move through the vascular system, and like I said, it is a diurnal sap flow, and um, so they can move downward into the roots, and if a tree dies in the adjacent healthy uh, tree that's grafted, can actually pull those spores through the connected um, water conducting system into that adjacent healthy tree, but it requires a functional root graft. The um, frequency of root grafts depends on the species of trees. And then there are also um, root grafts between, you know, within a species. So say a red oak, northern red oak, or northern red oak, but you can also get 
uh, intraspecific between species grafting. Um, so that's a difference. Also, these grafts um, are dependent on soil type. So whether you have a light textured soil or a heavy textured soil. So the lighter the texture, the greater the uh, probability of grafting. It also depends on diameter of trees, um, of the source tree, the oak will, killed by the oak oak fungus and the, you know, the nearest tree. So if the diameters are larger, there's a greater probability of grafting to occur. And also topography affects this and the distance, of course, between the trees. So in general, you know, 50 feet is, a, is kind of a rule of thumb, but it's not the absolute. But anything, a healthy tree within 50 feet of a disease tree certainly is of great concern. All right, key approaches to managing root graft spread. Um, first, and historically has been done most commonly here in Minnesota, is severing these root connections started out long ago using a trenching machine that would get down to about 48 inches. And now we, we've moved up in, um, to massive equipment like this uh, Caterpillar um, that uses a 60 inch long blade and that can um, be placed to strategically and disrupt those common, uh, that common, common connection. It doesn't necessarily hit the root graft, it just breaks any roots between those trees. And then uh, two other methods that you'll hear about today are creating dead zones of trees using herbicides, and then root rupture and stump extraction, which we'll also hear about today. So I just uh, wanted to emphasize this point before we do move into these uh, excellent case studies that are coming. And then the point is that placement of either the vibratory pile line or the edge of the treatments that you'll hear about today um, is very crucial. And there are models that have been used. This is a historical model developed by Dave French back in the 1970s. And uh, it's been modified by people, experienced users, oak wilt foresters who know oak wilt, especially in Minnesota. And they'll use this as a basic model, but then they'll modify it. Um, so this, I think, is still commonly used in Minnesota for oak wilt control. And we have actually documented efficacy of this in the Three Rivers Park District. And we're currently documenting this on the, Anoka, or on the, the sand plants of central Minnesota and hope to have results in five years. Um, but the idea is just to place the most important line is the primary line, which is um, you have the diseased trees, you have a tier of healthy trees, and then you have this, um, the outline tier of healthy trees. And you put that primary line between that inner tier of healthy looking trees and these outer ones. So this is, um, you know, kind of a fly by the seat of your pants, some call it, but I call it a rule of thumb. And then in the early 1990s, Johan Bruin and uh, a colleague of his was a statistician, uh, developed a mathematical model that was built on Eric Menji's work in the late uh, 1970s, early 1980s uh, in Wisconsin, where um, Menji's discovered that tree diameters and distance between trees was very important and whether an oak, a red oak tree would really become affected. So then um, Johan Bruin and, and his colleague uh, carried this to the next level and developed these statistical models. And it basically, they have two confidence, of, um, confidence levels that they use, a 99 and a 95%, depending on how cautious you want to be. And it's, uh, they have models by soil type. And this is what you see on the screen is just how that example of how that model is applied. And I show this because you're going to be, this is the model that has been used in the case studies that you'll be hearing about. So that's it. And I'll pass it off to the, the first case study. Time for one quick question. We have one online. Uh, the question online is about northern pin oaks and spraying hornet spray during the high risk season. Have you heard of that? Would that be effective um, in areas if uh, storms say take down branches of northern pin oaks? So is this, I'm not familiar with the spray, hornet spray? The hornet spray is the question, yeah. And I, I'm not familiar with that, but um, what can be done is to paint fresh wounds with any kind of paint. 
Gary Johnson here in Forest Resources and I have talked about this issue. Um, it, it can just be any, it can be a latex paint that you, if you have to prune a tree for any reason during the high risk season here in Minnesota, we advise painting that wound. So I, I don't know what this hornet's way is, but you certainly can paint the wounds even just with latex paint or a tree dressing or even to prevent the insects from coming in contact with those open uh, vessels in the xylem. Does that help? It helps. We will have time for more questions at the end when all of our speakers have uh, gone through. But uh, for now, our second speaker is Laura Ruling. Uh, and so Laura is a researcher here at the University of Minnesota Department of Forest Resources. But in her previous life, uh, was a research forester with the Wisconsin DNR. And that's really what she's going to talk about here in this uh, case study about girdling and herbicides. So Laura, take it away. All right, thanks, Matt. So yeah, as Matt said, this is work that I did in my previous position with Wisconsin DNR. So uh, I haven't thought about it too much in the re too much recently. So we'll see how this goes. But there's been a lot of other people that have worked on this. Um, Jed Meunier is the primary investigator on this project up until recently, and he took a different position with the Wisconsin DNR. So which is part of why I'm giving this talk today. Um, and this is adapted from a talk that he gave. Also, Becky Gray, Phil Gamlin, Dustin Bronson, Teresa Pearson, all of the Wisconsin DNR. So it's been a big collaborative project. Spacebar, not the arrow keys. Okay. Um, so I don't really, Jenny gave a lot more background than um, I need to give and that I would be <laughs> do a very good job giving. So, um, but basically, so I'm not going to do go into that, but basically what we found is that root grafting is really responsible for the transmission to the largest number of trees. That overland spread is important for, for moving oak wilt farther, but the largest number of trees that are going to be affected by oak wilt um, are going to get it through root grafting. So controlling transmission is really, really one of the most important things we can do is to interrupt that root grafting one way or another. And so currently, cost sharing is only available for root graft barriers. So that's um, what Jenny was showing there with the plows or pulling the stumps out or things like that that are really invasive, very can be very expensive. And um, there's a lot of reasons why this might not work. If you have a lot of topography, you might not be able to get equipment in there. Um, a private landowner may or may not be able to afford to do things like that. So there's alternatives that have been in practice that people have been using for a while. Um, Marathon County, which is in central Wisconsin, kind of a Wausau area, they've been using this girdle herbicide treatment for quite a while to basically kill the infected tree and then the ring of trees around it. And they had seen a lot of success with it. So the point of this study was to formally test that and um, see if this girdle herbicide treatment was an effective alternative to root graft barriers to eliminate the underground spread of oak wilt. So um, for this study, we wanted to select pretty high risk sites. So again, this is a lot of what um, Jenny talked about, things that make that sites that are likely to have more root grafting. So we chose sites with a higher composition of red oak. Um, we chose sites with lower slopes because um, with more topography, those trees tend to graft less. So we wanted the trees that grafted more. So we chose sites with lower slopes. Um, we had a, a high, higher basal area. So basically if there's more larger trees in an area, they're more likely to be grafted. If, they're, if it's more of like an open savanna, there's a lot more space between them, so they're not going to be grafted as much. Um, and we chose those sandier soils, which those sites with those sandier soils where grafting is more likely to be happening. And also one of the one of the other requirements for the sites was that it had to be at least a quarter of a mile away from any known adjacent active oak wilt pocket because we didn't want underground spread coming in from the sides of our treatment and messing up our treatment that way. Um, so I have the old scientific name on here, so, <laughs> um, but yeah, so, uh, and then after all of these sites, we um, confirmed the presence of the oak wilt fungus through either a culture growth test or um, the second year that we were doing this study, the Forest Health Lab at Wisconsin was testing out a molecular test for this um, pathogen, because when you take the samples, and I don't know, maybe Jenny can speak to this, maybe it's, I don't know how important that is, but you are supposed to keep the samples cool because mm -hmm. you 
need to keep that fungus alive if you're going to do growth tests. So in the field, that can be a little bit challenging. So we were like overnight shipping and all these coolers and stuff to the Forest Health Lab the first year. And that molecular test, I think um, Kyoko Scanlon, they're still working on comparing the molecular test and the culture growth test, but they've seen a lot of success with that. Um, so this study consisted of 53 oak wilt packets, 45 treatments, and eight controls. You're going to see these numbers bounce around slightly because a few of them got harvested after a year or two, so we don't have data for all year for all of these. But so if some of the numbers don't add up, that's probably why. Um, but these sites are across uh, Wisconsin, kind of from the southwest to the northeast, and they also covered a range of soil types. So we had kind of a fairly even distribution, which just kind of worked out, which was great. Um, sandy soils, loamy sand, or sandy loam. Mm -hmm. So, all right, methods and treatments. At each of these sites, we went in and identified all the infected trees within a packet. So we went in in the late summer, early fall, before you actually get leaves start to change, which is when you can see the, most, the symptoms the most obviously. So we went in and found all the infected trees within a pocket, and that's a nice red X there. And um, we used that, that model that Jenny was talking about to find all the trees, all the trees, trees that we needed to treat within a certain radius of the infected trees. So um, I don't really need to go into it because Jenny just talked about it, but basically this model uses the diameter of the infected tree and of the nearby potentially healthy tree, as well as the soil type to determine which ones should be, could be potentially grafted to the infected tree and should be treated. So at each infected tree and potentially infected treatment tree, we use a double girdle with a chain, oh, I should point with the pointer. So um, we double girdled with the chainsaw, as you can see in this picture to the right, and then um, use an herbicide, which was Element 4, also known as Triclopyr 4, also potentially goes by a few other names. 25% um, mix, mix of that with diesel. So spread that into the, into the girdles there. Um, we also had two different controls, a girdle-only control where we did the double girdling, but we didn't use herbicide. And then a no treatment control where we just monitored the rate of spread of oak wilt. Um, I think I'll talk about the soil types later. Okay, so also at these sites, we um, did stem mapping. And so we can see, you can see in this picture here, um, we have four infected trees, those like teal highlighted trees, and then 47, I think, 47 trees that we treated. Um, so we get from the stem mapping, we can get an idea of the area that this pocket was affected by, we can get an idea of how, how much actual wood was, how many trees were killed here, and an idea of the size of the gap that was created by um, girdling all these trees. Um, and we also did regeneration surveys within each pocket. So we have regeneration information for pre-treatment, which is like the year of treatment, probably like 10 minutes pre-treatment. And then um, we'll go back again five years post-treatment and look at regeneration there again. Um, so these sites will be continually monitored for five years. They were installed in 2015 and 2016, so we're not there yet. Um, but so they'll be continued to monitor until 2020 and 2021. Um, we went back one year after treatment to all these sites, and if there was a breakout of oak wilt after the first year, we did retreat. We would treat the newly infected tree and then again a radius around it. Um, but after year one, we just monitored to see if oak wilt broke out of that containment. Um, we don't need to go into this. We collected a lot of data. This is just from the first year. We treated over 2,800 trees, um, 260 infected trees, and spent a lot of time girdling trees, nothing with chainsaw. Um, all right, so results. One of the first things that we started to notice the first year is the effect of the herbicide at just killing the crown. Obviously, it takes longer to kill the roots, and we can't tell that the roots are dead just from crown death, but crown death. But we did see a, a number of trees leaf out the next year. So they were treated in the fall, and then we come back the next year and have these 
like little tiny weeny looking leaves on them, as you can see from this, this picture looking up. So at the majority of sites with the herbicide treatment, the trees didn't leaf out. At thir 30 of the 45 sites, we had none of the treated trees leafed out. Um, and at another nine, so for a total of 87% of the sites, there were only only one, less than three trees, or three or less, fewer trees leafed out. So for mo the most part, the herbicide crown killed the trees very quickly. However, there were a couple sites where it just didn't seem to work, where the trees leafed out like this a lot. So those two sites that are, have greater than 10, the sites were the sites with the most number of trees alive after one year. Um, the first one was this site in Marathon County where uh, 17 or 24 percent of the trees were still like had still leafed out the next year and another one in O'Connell County so they weren't in the same area um, had 27 or 39 percent of the trees that still leafed out the second year and we don't know why this happened they were treat they were plots that, or pockets that were treated a little bit later but they were treated even the same day as a pocket that had 100 percent top kill we it wasn't we don't even think it was the herbicide mix because we had two pockets that we treated in the same day and on one like one of the pockets very nearby it had we had total of a crown kill and then the other one we didn't so there's something going on there and we don't know exactly what i don't know if maybe there we didn't get as deep of girdles with the chainsaw maybe this one that had all the live trees was the second one we did that day. The chainsaw may have been duller, I don't know, but there's definitely something going on there. Um, and then this bottom table is just the girdle only controls, of which there are only four, but you can see that potentially it looks like the herbicide is definitely doing something. So, um, but the real, the real results of this are the effectiveness of the containment treatment. So, did, after we put in these treatments, did we see oak wilt spread outside of those treated trees? And so there's kind of two ways to look at this. You can think of this as a one-year treatment or a two-year treatment. So you remember we went back to those sites after um, one year and if it had escaped, we looked again to see and we treated again and that any we treated the pocket a little bit further out. So if you think of it as a one-year treatment in the tree in the sites that have been monitored. For two years, which is all of them, we had 78% success. If you think of it as a two-year treatment, we had 82% success. So that's pretty good. Um, ha only half of the sites have been monitored for three years because they were these are the ones that were installed in 2015. So after three years of monitoring, we see 71% success if you just consider one year of treating, or 75% success after two years. So there's these are really preliminary numbers. There's no statistics or anything. And we need to keep keep monitoring for an extended period of time. But preliminary results are looking like this is generally working, but it's definitely not 100%. Um, how much time do I have, Matt? Uh, it's another three or four minutes. Okay. Um, so one of the issues that we came across is um, what Jenny talked about a little bit is the so the soils are important for those models. So those models um, that we looked at the more sandy the soils are, basically the longer distances that you, you might have root grafting, and so the longer distance you need to treat out. So what we tried to do the first year in 2015 was to test soil texture in the, in, in the field, which turns out if you're not a soil scientist, you might not be that good at. Um, so that's what this uh, little box in the lower left is. It's kind of like a field test just in your hand can you form the soil into a ball? Can you form it into a ribbon with your thumb and forefinger? Um, so we did that in the field and we used that to determine what model we would use to treat the, treat the stands. However, we also took soil samples and took them back to the lab and did a particle size analysis. Turns out we only, were, we only um, did the correct treatment half of the time, 15 out of 30 for the first year. I, but of those 15 where we applied the wrong model, in nine of them, we actually applied a more aggressive model. So we used the sand model where we should have used the sandy loam or could have used the sandy loam model. So we potentially removed more trees than we would have needed to. Um, however, when we looked at thorough data, that was also correct less, the fewer times than our data was correct or than our field test was correct. So 
it's this is definitely a challenge if you don't know a, if you aren't a soil scientist and you don't really know a lot about what you're doing with soils. That's definitely a challenge is knowing what model to use. Um, the reason that some of the, the treatments failed wasn't necessarily because we used a less aggressive model. So in 2015, we had six treatments that spread at some point, either after one or two years, but only two of those were the ones where we incorrectly used the less aggressive model. So it's not, so that I don't think that ruined the study or anything like that. But after this kind of failure in 2015 with identifying soils, we ended up using the same model in all the sites in 2016, so the more aggressive model. Um, other things that we're going to look at in the future, we're going to continue monitoring these um, for five years. We can, we're going to look at, um, we'll be able to look at net growth loss with the treatments versus with just letting oak wilt spread, seeing how many trees we actually removed. Um, where there's regeneration considerations. So we'll know those gap sizes, so we'll be able to look at oak regeneration in those different gap sizes. Um, we'll also be able to look at the potential transfer of oak wilt to the newly regenerating species because we didn't remove those standing dead trees. So um, it's different than, than like pulling out the stumps. And, so there is potentially some spores there that could infect the newly regenerating trees. Um, there's also potential for a regeneration comparison between this work and the work that Ben's going to look at, or Ben's going to talk about next. Um, so that's a lot, this is a lot lower disturbance type of treatment. So there's a lot of understory, understory disturbance, sorry. <laughs> um, but oak is a disturbance adapted species. So there's a lot of potential there for looking at differences in regeneration. And lots of people worked on this project. And thanks to all of them. Uh, Laura, we have two questions okay. online, uh, both about girdling. Uh, the okay. first one, how deep did you cut for the girdling? Um, I think two, two or three inches into the wood, I think three inches. So some of the smaller trees we ended up just cutting down if you were going to be girdling to like nothing left, because that seems pretty dangerous. <laughs> And then a second question, girdled trees are hazardous. How did the study protect the public from these hazardous trees? Uh, so these are mostly on like county and state land that are pretty pretty hard to get to. Um, but I mean, definitely like hunters and people that are actively choosing to go farther out into the woods could be, um, could be, it could be there. So we did a couple, a couple of sites were in, were, in more public areas and the tree, the hazard trees were removed after like a year. So um, honestly, that's probably something, there's paint on them. They look like they're dead, <laughs> but yeah, the ones that were like more, were closer to where the public might be uh, were removed after a year, but the other ones are standing dead. And I think that's an issue that as we continue to monitor this in the future, that is something that we definitely need to be aware of. Is there a question in the room for Laura while we switch presenters? Go ahead. I'm curious what's known about the effect, if there is any difference on the advanced regeneration or different size classes. Is it likely that a bad outbreak of oak will just wipe out any of those regardless of size class? I don't know if maybe this is a Jenny question. I think there is a set like less than an inch diameter or something. Is that a kind of rule? Is there a rule of thumb? Oh, <laughs> um, is there a rule of thumb for like what size classes of oaks are affected by oak wilt? Oh, so, no, they, we can, you'll see seedlings. Okay. Yeah, sorry. All right. Yeah, that was definitely a journey question. <laughs> I don't know. Great. Uh, well, again, we'll have time at the end uh, for questions for all the speakers again. Uh, but I want to introduce our next speaker. Um, and that's Ben Walker. Uh, ben is a, a silviculture forester um, at the Bombay Nicolet National Forest. Um, and actually, fun fact about Ben, his first job was at this national forest. And then he went and did other things uh, throughout the state of Wisconsin, I know. And then eventually got a permanent position at the forest. So uh, he'll talk maybe a little bit about that and particularly the OPO control that they've been doing uh, on the national forest. And so Ben, it looks like we can hear you coming through just fine. Uh, so you can take it away. All right, can you see my PowerPoint? All right, 
So thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. It's good to be with you uh, through the web today. Like Matt said, I'm a forester on the Lakewood Leona district of the Schwamgen Nicolay National Forest. And I've been involved in oak wilt in one way, shape, or form for several years now. And today I'll be talking about uh, how we've been dealing with it on the district here since the early 2000s. So for those of you who don't know where Lakewood, Wisconsin is, it's about an hour and a half northwest of Green Bay, as you see on the map here. And uh, just a little bit of background on the district here. Um, we have a wide variety of forest types and ecosystems um, within our boundaries, but obviously the focus today will be on our oak dominated stands. Uh, these stands originated in, uh, from the last major fire in 1925. Uh, these regenerating stands were a mixture of aspen, paper birch, red maple, and red oak. Uh, the stands were entered about on average two times between the 1970s and 1990s. And the focus of the first entries were to remove the high risk aspen and birch. And the later entries focused on high quality red oak saw timber. So a lot of the red maple was removed. Um, so this resulted in almost a pure northern red oak forest and um, mostly single aged and almost 95 years old at this point. So obviously this would be a major issue if something like oak wilt were to uh, find its way on our district. Well, oak wilt was first identified on the district in 1997 at a campground and it was uh, successfully treated using a vibratory plow uh, to break the root grafts. And then in 2001, it was found on an active timber sale. And subsequently, many infection centers were found scattered over a large area. Uh, the vibratory plow method was not a feasible option given the uneven terrain and rocky conditions, which is found on most of our district. Uh, so we needed a new method uh, to treat these sites. Here you see Manfred uh, Milky, and uh, he's a pathologist with Northeastern State and Private Forestry out of the Twin Cities. Uh, he's since retired, but he invented and will forever be known as the father of the root rupture method for oak wilt control. And basically how this method works is um, cutting and removing infected uh, and adjacent healthy trees, and then using an excavator to rip out and overturn the stumps and root wads. Uh, by doing this, the root grafts are broken and the diseased tissues are isolated from the neighboring healthy oaks. Uh, to our knowledge, this method has never been attempted anywhere else prior to being developed on the Schwamgen Nicolay. And like was stated earlier, we use a two ring approach. And uh, for the first ring, we add the DBHs of the original infected oak to the nearest neighboring oak. and uh, using the chart, as you'll see on the next slide. Um, you've seen this two times before already, but we use it as well um, for both rings. And uh, we usually err on the side of caution and use the, the sandy soil distances. Um, even if it may be loamy sand, we still use the, the sandy, the numbers in the sandy column. Um, and it usually works out pretty well. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out was that uh, for clumps of oaks, uh, which we have quite a bit of on our district, we add all those DBHs together. So if there's a clump of oaks, it's more likely to be in compared to a single oak tree. Uh, so now that our uh, seasonal employees have gone around and identified all the different oak wilt sites on the district, uh, they mark the oaks um, that need to be removed based on our two ring system. And we start to set up a stewardship sale. And what this basically means is the purchasers will bid on two things. The first is the value of the timber. And then the second is the cost of doing the service work, which in this case is using an excavator to pull out and overturn the oak stumps and root wads. Um, so the service work is made up, uh, the bid is made up on a per stump basis and it's subtracted from the bid on the, on the timber. Here's just a picture of a sale that's been marked and the trees to be removed are marked with a yellow ring. 
And here's a picture of a logger and an excavator performing the work. And as you can see, uh, this work is being done with snow on the ground. Uh, it's a very tight time frame from when you start seeing the oak wilt in late July, early August, um, to laying out the units, cruising them, advertising the sale, awarding it, and everything like that. Uh, so the purchaser usually doesn't go get, get to it until November or December, um, but he usually gets it done um, before the ground freeze is solid. And also there's a clause in our contracts where the wood must be processed by before March of the following year, um, just to prevent any inoculum from infecting the site again the following year. All right, so from on-site observations and conversations with purchasers, um, we've learned that uh, the frost tooth attachment works best uh, with a thumb to flip out, dig out and then flip over the stumps and root wads. Uh, this method uh, does expose a lot of mineral soil. There's a lot of disturbance, um, but we're actually seeing really good regeneration in our oak wilt pockets on the district. Um, and it's usually a wide variety of species. Um, so it's almost a blessing in disguise because we have these single-aged uh, pure northern red oak stands, um, but now we're seeing scattered small pockets of mixed hardwoods coming back in. So it's actually increasing the, the species and structural diversity in our oak stands. So yeah, it's, it's gonna look like a bomb went off the, uh, right after it's been harvested and the work has taken place. Um, but regeneration can come back pretty quickly and it can be hard to notice after a few years. So for example, a site can go from looking like this to 10 years down the road, it can look like this. This isn't the exact same site as the, the previous slide, but you get the idea here. Uh, more times than not, there's a good mix of species and it's fully stocked within five or 10 years. So I consider us pretty blessed here on this district. Um, here you can see a lot of nice quality oak saw logs that are produced from these sales. And from 2004 to 2012, these sales produced about uh, four and a half million board feet of timber. Um, again, some nice quality saw timber that's being utilized instead of being lost to oak wilt and left to rot. I apologize, I don't have more current data, but uh, between 2001 and 2012, there were a total of 312 treated sites in our district, uh, removing uh, almost 27,000 trees. In terms of success, uh, the monitoring of treatment sites have shown that approximately 71% of the time, no infections were found for a period of four years after the initial treatment. And greater than 90% greater than 90 of the time, the infection is no longer active for a period of four years following two treatments or less. So overall, I would say we have pretty good success rates with this method. Uh, just some findings. Um, the disruption treatment method works, but it has limitations. It works best on small isolated infections uh, with the highest likelihood of success with the first treatment. Uh, early detection is, and prompt treatment is the key. And larger infections, for example, if you come up on an oak wilt site and there's already 15 dead oaks, you most likely will need to have multiple years of treatments and will have a lower overall success rate. Um, also, there are some record keeping challenges. Um, we've been dealing with hundreds of sites on our district, um, which in, um, cause some challenges for sure. Um, sometimes it's unclear when we're trying to differentiate between a new overland infection or a root grafted infection from a failed treatment several years ago. And also if two sites eventually merge into one site, it can be a, a, a record keeping challenge for sure. Um, we've also found that treatments have reduced the aerial extent of infections. Uh, seen here on this map, uh, the green circles are the successful treatments, and, the, and then the yellow, orange, or red circles represent unsuccessful treatments. And you can see that by successfully treating some of the outliers, uh, we've narrowed down the area extent quite a bit. 
uh, which is the ultimate goal of this, uh, containing the inoculum to a, as small of an area as possible. So as you can see from this table, uh, stewardship contracting for treatment of oak wool has worked out great for the Forest Service. Uh, the value of the oak saw timber has far exceeded the cost of the service work. And from 2004 to 2012, there was a positive net value of over $625,000. Uh, so here on the district, uh, we've decided that the best way to deal with oak wool is to not get it in the first place. Um, it is far easier to do this than to eradicate or control oak wilt once you have it. And once you have inoculum in the neighborhood, it's much more difficult to prevent new overland infections. So we do have two oak wilt quarantine sites in our district, a northern zone and southern zone. And there's signs posted at every intersection and maps are given out whenever somebody comes in to purchase a firewood cutting permit. And in these areas, no cutting or removing of any firewood is allowed. Uh, the different colors on this map represent our historic timber sale payment units. And the yellow triangles represent all the oak wood sites that were found in 2004. And you can see that they correlate very well. Um, so in addition, in addition to the oak wood quarantine sites, uh, we have implemented a timing restriction in our timber sale contracts. Uh, limiting the harvesting to a period of, of fall and winter uh, when the, as mentioned before, the nitidula beetles are less active. Um, and I believe that was it. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Otherwise, you can shoot me an email and I'll try and get you in contact with someone who might know the answer. Uh, great, thank you, Ben. Uh, we have one question online. Uh, how do you ensure the infected oaks aren't sent to an area free of the disease when you're harvesting? Can you say that again? I didn't quite hear you. Yeah, so the question was, how do you ensure the infected oaks are not sent to an area that's free of the disease? Um, so this is done, this harvesting is done during the fall and winter when the beetles aren't active. And uh, like we said, the timber sale contracts have something in them where uh, all the wood has to be processed by uh, March of the following year. So um, they actually, once they get to the mill or whatever, they actually have to have something signed that says, yes, we've processed all of this wood and there's no longer the inoculum uh, present. So uh, everything is taken off site and processed at the mill before the next spring. Great, uh, thanks Ben. I might ask Laura and Jenny um, if there are any questions here in St. Paul or if you're online, please type them into the chat area. Uh, it's about one o'clock now, but we'll stay around until we answer all the questions. So, Yeah, I have a question from Ben. Um, what confidence level model did they use? You said they used the sand and soil model, but did they use the 95 or the 99%? Uh, I am not sure about that. All I know is that we used the, always use the sandy soils side of the chart. Uh, questions from here in the room for any of our speakers? Anything related to Oakwell? Yeah. Jenny, you mentioned that painting the wounds uh, is important if we make a cut during the high risk time. Yeah. Now, is there a window of uh, can the can the cut dry out and it it doesn't become an issue anymore? Um, first, uh, those the wounds are only so they have to be silent. And then you repeat the question. Yeah. Okay. Um, the question had to do with the, the wounds that are receptive to infection by the oak wilt fungus. And I don't want to reiterate, first it has to be a xylem penetrating wound, number one. And then I think your question had to do with um, really how long is that wound susceptible? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Can the wound dry out, for example? So um, let me start off. I, you know, I, I apologize, but I'm going back to a basic 
a biology fact. The oak oak fungus is not a, a good competitor. It's a poor saprophyte, but it's a very virulent pathogen. So uh, there were studies done decades ago that showed if you put the oak oak fungus in with a uh, biocontrol type fungus, it you know you can actually prevent infection from occurring if you permit it at the same time or you put that biocontrol fungus in 24 hours before. So that's a consideration, you know, keep that in mind, that uh, the wounds, it's really fresh wounds that are most susceptible is what I'm saying, before other uh, fungi can get in there and colonize the surface. Um, generally, we, you know, I think about 72 hours is probably the highest, um, or the time period that those wounds are most susceptible. And um, then also you have to remember the behavior of the, the, the insects are a number of knitted beetles that will come into wounds, and especially wounds that, you know, they're maybe two weeks old and produce a lot of sap flow and kind of fermented sap flow. Well, you'll get these orange and black knitted beetles. Well, they're not the primary vectors. But a fresh wound, there's that fresh wound volatile that attracts the beetle. It's a really a fresh wound, and I mentioned that we I had made some wounds just down at Murphy Hanrahan State Park in a controlled study, and and within 10 minutes, I made a wound and I found these principal vector nitidula beetle species there. 10 minutes. So I wanted to make the point that if you're going to paint a wound, you can't just uh, trim a tree and then go back and paint. You've got to paint, you've got to paint it right away because those, those beetles will come. So I think I made my key points on that. Other questions from speakers? Going, going. All right, well, let's thank all of our speakers and Ben. I'll join them all. Uh, I did want to mention also Madison Robin sent a link for uh, getting continuing ed credits, uh, if that's of interest to you. Uh, and also a link to provide feedback on the webinar, so that's there. We'll also share a recording of this and some follow up materials um, in an email. And so we'll get that email message uh, probably within the next day or so. Um, and I did want to mention also um, the, and make make a plug for the Silver Culture Library. And so I shared, I think, three case studies. Uh, and we'll share those again in the follow up email uh, that really highlight much of the work that we've learned about today. Um, and so those are available in the Silver Culture Library. Uh, and again, we have support through the uh, USDA NIFA uh, Renewable Resources Extension Act um, for really uh, developing a lot of forest health content on the Silver Culture Library. And so with that, uh, we'll close. I just want to mention quickly too, August 20th is our next webinar. Uh, and we're going to be learning about family forest landowners. Um, and Stephanie Snyder with the Forest Service will be talking about uh, private landowners in the lake states and kind of their demographics and what we can learn about them. Uh, so thanks for joining us, everyone.